Okay, everybody, Justin Morell here. I'm here in Mineral Wells, Texas, and I wanted to start off a Bible study series here at a place called Penitentiary Hollow. Uh, there's all these uh, rock uh, crevices behind me. I'll show you what I'm looking at here. So I'll take you down in there, show you what it's like. It's, uh, it's actually really, really cool down there. So I want to do a Bible study on this question of can you lose your salvation? Uh, dealing with, you know, once saved, always saved, eternal security. Uh, can you fall away from God? Can you depart from the faith? So you'll also get a little tour of Penitentiary Hollow here. I'll show you what it's like uh, while we uh, just go through the scriptures and, and talk the Bible. You know, one little problem I had is that I came all this way, I drove about two and a half hours with my family to do a Bible study video here, and I forgot to pack my Bible. <laughs> I packed everything else. We packed food for a couple days because we're camping out with our camper and blankets for all the kids and games and everything for the family, and I just forgot my Bible. But this is 2019, and I should be able just to use my phone. So I'm going to look up a bunch of scriptures just right here on my phone, and that should get the job done. Okay, let me give you the grand tour of Penitentiary Hollow here down below. I heard this was actually used as some type of penitentiary at some point. Uh, prisoners were kept down here, um, I, obviously because of the walls, and they could have guards up on top. Uh, I haven't verified that, it's just something I heard. It, it would make sense for the name. Um, but look at this, this is a huge uh, crevice here, rocks, huge rocks on both sides, and then almost like a center table. I could think of, uh, <laughs> I could think of some uh, native rituals where they'd use that centerpiece as a human sacrifice table or something. Uh, but I'll show you around. Look at this place, this is just one big giant crevasse with uh, huge rocks on both sides, crevices all over the place, tunnels. This place is pretty cool. One of the first things I did with my kids when I brought them here, I showed them 
this uh, crevice, crack in the rock, is actually like a cave, and you can walk through it. You got to be careful when you first get in, because it's pretty narrow. <laughs> to remember when talking about doctrines like can you lose your salvation or do you have eternal security is to put your emotions aside. Uh, some people make a decision on this matter simply based on their personal preference, what they wish was true, uh, what they hope is true, but what you need to ask is what does the Bible actually say? So let's look at some verses. In, uh, well, in Mark 8.38, and this was one of the first verses uh, that convinced me of you know this idea that you can actually lose your salvation in mark 838 Jesus said whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the father with uh, his holy angels and that's because when I first became a Christian I was invited to a Bible study at a pizza place uh, but I was, I was almost ashamed to go because somebody I knew worked there and I knew them from my previous uh, life of sin and the party world and uh, they were popular and cool or whatever and uh, I was ashamed uh, if they saw me at a Bible study with this elderly lady um, at that pizza place and she told me, she said, look, if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you and uh, the Bible also says, if you deny him, uh, then he will deny you and so I realized that there is this conditional security that we have in Christ. Um, and this was one of the first verses that, that taught me that. All right, I moved the camera a little bit closer. I felt like that was just a little too far away. But uh, I got tons of verses I want to share with you on this issue. Uh, also, in John 15, 6, Jesus said, uh, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And the men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So here Jesus says, if you don't abide in him, then you're going to be cut off and burnt, cast into the fire. Um, this word abide in the Greek means to continue in. Um, so it's not like it's saying, you know, oh, if someone's not in Jesus, like they've never been in him at all. It's saying if you're in him, but you don't continue in him if you don't abide in him if you don't remain in him then you're cut off and cast into the fire and burnt and so this verse also is one of the first verses that convinced me 18 years ago that uh, it's possible to abide not that it's possible to lose your salvation to uh, you know as a new convert I came out of the party world of drugs and alcohol and this verse helped uh, teach me that if I were to return to my old ways and to return to my old sins, uh, to the way of living that I lived before I was converted, uh, then I would no longer be saved and I would once again uh, be in danger of hell fire. So, so this doctrine of once saved, always saved says, uh, you know, once you get saved, you're always saved even if you fall away, even if you later become a Hindu or later become an atheist. Stanley uh, teaches that, that you know, even if uh, you uh, later become an atheist, if you had one moment of faith at one point in your life, then you're justified forever, even if you're not a Christian anymore. Uh, perseverance of the saints, uh, the Calvinist doctrine is a little bit different, and that teaches that if uh, you're truly saved, you will automatically persevere onto the end. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. You will endure onto the end. Uh, but this verse contradicts both of them. This verse says that you can start out in Christ, then fall away, and then be burnt. So once saved, always saved is false, and perseverance of the saints is false. Uh, what you see, the doctrine of Jesus is conditional security. 
Uh, Paul also said about himself, so this is the Apostle Paul's doctrine, he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Or some translations will say reprobate. So here Paul is saying that if, if he does not continue um, in Christ to subject his body in Christian uh, discipline, if he you know, gives himself over to the indulgence of the flesh, then he himself would become a reprobate. He himself would become a castaway. Uh, even after preaching to others and all the ministry that he's done and converting others, uh, he himself would be cast away. And so that was, again, one of the early verses that taught me 18 years ago. Uh, the Apostle Paul's doctrine is that you need to uh, discipline your body and uh, guard yourself against sin, uh, lest you yourself become a reprobate. Now, uh, the once saved, always saved, or Calvinist crowd, Perseverance of the Saints crowd, say, well, this is talking about being a castaway uh, from, from the people that he preached to, uh, that the churches would reject him. Well, uh, first of all, I don't think uh, some of those early churches would reject him. Uh, you see some of the problems in, uh, in Corinth, and this is who he's talking to, and uh, even Corinth had uh, incest and uh, problems in the church. Uh, well, he said in 2 uh, Corinthians, his first letter made them repent unto salvation, so some of those false converts in the church uh, got saved. Uh, but he's, but, uh, so that, that, that's not who he's concerned about being cast away from. He's, he's concerned about being a reprobate uh, by God. Uh, that word reprobate is only used in the Bible to talk about being uh, rejected by God, never to be uh, rejected by men. And so uh, Paul is saying that his own uh, security is conditional upon his perseverance in holiness. Again, talking about the Apostle Paul's doctrine, he said in Romans 8.13, but if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So here saying, if you, uh, if you live after the flesh, you will die. Now that's not just talking about the death of the body. It's talking about the death of the soul. Because he says, if you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Now, you could die in early death as a Christian martyr. So mortifying the deeds of the flesh doesn't guarantee that you will live uh, physically. Uh, but mortifying the deeds of the body has to do with the life of the soul. Uh, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Uh, Jesus said, um, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And uh, at least uh, it'd be better for you uh, to go through life without a hand than to be cast into hell with both. So mortifying the deeds of the flesh uh, that you might live uh, is, is in regards to salvation. And Paul is saying to Christians here, if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. So even after salvation, uh, we still have a free will choice to go the way of the, the Lord or the way of the devil, the way of sin or the way of righteousness. We still have a choice between heaven and hell. Uh, our salvation is still conditional uh, upon us and upon what we do. And then again, with the Apostle Paul's doctrine, he taught in Romans chapter 11. Uh, he said, Behold... In, in verse 22, uh, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God, on them which fell severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. So here he's saying that the Gentiles were grafted in and Israel was cut off. But Israel was cut off because of their unbelief. So he says to the Gentiles, Be not high-minded, but fear lest you also be cut off, uh, just as Israel was. So again, our salvation is conditional upon us and upon what we do, whether we continue in his goodness uh, or, or not, whether we continue in faith or not. So Paul was saying that we have occasion, even as Gentiles grafted in, we still have occasion for fear. The problem with the once saved, always saved doctrine, or unconditional eternal security, is that you have no reason to fear. You'll never be cut off. Uh, you've been grafted in once and for all, so there's no reason to fear. And that's the opposite of what the Apostle Paul said when he said, be not high-minded, but fear. So that teaches um, 
conditional salvation, conditional election, and uh, conditional security. Because Paul is saying that don't be high-minded because you were grafted in, but fear. Uh, at least you also be cut off, he said, just like the unbelieving Jews were. So uh, the doctrine of once saved, always saved, or perseverance of the saints really um, leaves no room for the fear of God. Why should you fear being cut off if that's impossible? Uh, why should you fear, um, and it says, be, be not high-minded, but fear, uh, at least you also uh, be cut off. Uh, that makes no sense in the doctrine of once saved, always saved, only if uh, the doctrine of conditional security is true, uh, do we have any reason to fear, at least we be cut off. So this is Paul's uh, doctrine that he taught all throughout the New Testament. And Paul wasn't the only apostle who taught conditional security. Uh, we see in Jude chapter 1, verses uh, 4 to 6, uh, Jude taught the same thing. He said, For there are certain men who crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, this is talking about ungodly men who turn the grace of God into a license to sin. That would be people, obviously, like uh, Stephen Anderson, who teaches you don't have to repent of your sins uh, to be saved. And uh, these... Uh, obviously the uh, the easy believism crowd that denies uh, the lordship of Christ they deny that lordship has any uh, role in salvation that you don't submit to the lordship of Christ when you uh, convert to Christ they say that's a lordship salvation oh that's works and so they're denying the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ I like how A.W. Tozer said um, it doesn't say they denied the Savior Jesus Christ they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not his saviorhood they deny. It's the lordship that they deny. But then verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So here, uh, they were first saved, but then because of their unbelief, they were later destroyed. So James or, or Jude is saying that you can get saved and then be condemned, that this was a foreshadow of uh, the situation here with these ungodly men who are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And if you're going to turn God's grace into a license to sin, you need to be reminded that God, after he saved Israel out of Egypt, afterward destroyed them. And uh, also then the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He has reserved an everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So he's giving these examples to the church in reference to those who teach grace as a license to sin, that if you're going to use grace as a license to sin, uh, you're going to lose it. You're going to, uh, it's really not losing your salvation, it's really leaving your salvation. Uh, that you're, you're departing from the faith, uh, you're forsaking Christ, and uh, returning to the devil and returning to sin and uh, it's really not so much that you're losing your salvation it's that you are leaving your salvation okay well let's uh, let's continue the tour here of uh, penitentiary hollow and uh, we'll continue our bible study in a new location So if you can, in fact, uh, lose your salvation, the next question is how? How is it done? How can you lose your salvation? Uh, well, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26, and this was one of the verses that really sealed it for me. Uh, he says, For if we sin willfully after we've received uh, the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking on of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who has trotted underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace." 
So here, this is talking about someone who received the word. They didn't just hear the word, they received the word, and then they continued to sin willfully. And it says that uh, he that despised Moses' law died under two to three witnesses, but now this person is going to have even worse punishment because they have trodden underfoot the blood of the covenant where which they were sanctified. So this is talking about a believer who received the word, was sanctified by the word, but then they returned to their sin and willful disobedience to God, and the blood atonement of Christ is not a license to sin. That means the blood atonement does not cover those who continue in willful disobedience. The atonement forgives those who repent of their sin, but the atonement does not cover those who persist in willful disobedience. So the Calvinist argument of limited atonement is certainly out the window because this is saying that Jesus died and shed his blood even for those who are punished. In the Calvinist system of the atonement, uh, the atonement makes your punishment impossible. That's because it's a penal substitution and therefore uh, your punishment would be unjust since Christ was punished for you. That's a whole different video I'd like to do exposing the problems in penal substitution. But this is saying the atonement did not make your punishment impossible and the atonement was not limited because this person is trotting underfoot the blood of Christ and they're going to be punished for it. Uh, this certainly uh, can't be talking about an unbeliever uh, who the atonement wasn't made for, which is what the Calvinist system teaches, that the atonement uh, wasn't made for everyone. Uh, this is talking about Jesus dying even for those who are punished. John MacArthur tries to say, well, this is talking about the Jew who hears the gospel and then uh, hardens their heart to the gospel and turns back to their system of works. Uh, you know, well, this is the book of Hebrews, he would say, and this is talking to the Hebrews, so if a Jewish person returns to the, uh, you know, system of works, rather than trusting in grace, then there's no more sacrifice for sin. But this can't be talking about an unbeliever, because unbelievers don't receive the word. They don't receive the knowledge of the truth. Unbelievers are not sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't specify what type of sin uh, like returning to a system of works, other than that it's willful sin. So all it takes to lose your salvation is one willful sin, because one willful sin makes an entire impenitent heart, and an entire impenitent heart is unfit for the kingdom of God and doesn't meet the conditions of God's gracious forgiveness through the cross. So just one impenitent heart uh, or one sin makes one whole impenitent heart, and that's all it takes if you sin willfully. All right, listen, listen to what the Apostle Peter had to say on this topic. He said in 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 20 to 22, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so here it's saying that this is, this is talking about a saved person who escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's not talking about an unbeliever. An unbeliever doesn't escape the pollutions of the world. This is talking about someone who got saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then afterwards they're once again entangled therein. And now their latter end is worse than before. And uh, it would have been better if they hadn't known the way of righteousness than to have turned from the Holy Commandment. So that's how you become a backslider. That's how you lose your salvation, by turning from the Holy Commandment and uh, turning away from the way of righteousness. So that goes along with Hebrews 10.26, that you lose your salvation by willful sinning. But a turning away from the law of God, a turning away from the way of the Lord, and a, 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 a return to a life of sin. The principle of the scripture is that anybody who's in deliberate disobedience to God is under the wrath of God. 
Now the atonement makes it possible for God to turn away from his wrath when sinners turn away from their sin. But the atonement saves nobody from the wrath of God until they turn from their sins. If you continue in sin, then you're under the wrath of God despite the atonement that was made for you. Because the Bible says in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God, now this is the Apostle Paul writing, so this is after the atonement of Christ was made. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so anyone who has the truth and knows the truth, but they're living unrighteously, they're under the wrath of God. Now be that the truth of conscience, the truth of creation, the truth of the law of Moses, or the truth of the gospel. Whatever truth you're living in rebellion towards, that's the that's the reason uh, you're under the wrath of God. And so conversion, being a true Christian, is a submission to the truth. When you submit to the truth of God uh, through creation, through conscience, through the law, and through the gospel, it's just a complete and total surrender to the truth of God, uh, no matter what truth it is. But sin is rebellion against the truth, and sin brings the wrath of God. So if you have sin in your life, if you're holding the truth in unrighteousness, you're under the wrath of God, even despite the atonement that was made for you. Paul said in Romans 2, 5, But after thy heart and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the church in Rome. And he's warning them that if you have a hard and impenitent heart, then you're treasuring up for yourself wrath that will be revealed in the day of wrath. And so here's the principle. If you repent of your sin, you have the mercy of God. If you are impenitent over your sin, you have the wrath of God. It's either or. It's your choice. And so those who are impenitent abide under the wrath of God. So as a Christian, if you backslide into your sin, if you return to your life of sin, and you are impenitent over the sins that you are committing, now impenitent means that you're not changing your mind about it. You might feel bad about it, you might feel convicted about it, but if you don't change your mind about doing it, then you're still impenitent in heart. Uh, you still have a carnal mind until you change your mind. So anytime that you commit a sin that you are impenitent over. If, you're, if you repent of all your sins, but you hold on to just one, let's say you repent of drugs and alcohol because you know it's bad for you, but you, you hold on to your uh, pornography or you hold on to your uh, homosexuality or whatever your sin might be, if you hold on to just one sin, you have an impenitent heart. Just one sin puts you under the wrath of God. So a true Christian who is walking in faith, walking in holiness, is someone who has repented of all their sin. And it doesn't matter what sin it is, we know it's all bad for us, and we have such faith and trust in God that we don't want to commit any sin. And so we walk by faith, overcoming temptation, not impenitent over any sin, and that's the person who uh, is abiding under the mercy of God. You know, Paul reminded the Corinthians, because there is uh, lots of sin in the Corinthian church. He said there was incest, uh, men uh, sleeping with his uh, stepmother, there was uh, carnality, and uh, there was all this unrighteousness in the church of Corinth. And so Paul reminded them in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now as a new convert, I told you I came out of uh, drugs and alcohol. I used to get drunk every night. I used to get high every day. Uh, and it runs in my family. My father is that way. And my grandfather and his father, they're all alcoholics. Uh, my father still is. Pray for him, please. Uh, he's still, he's, he's a homeless uh, drug addict and drunkard. Um, and he needs the Lord. Um, but, but the Lord delivered me out of that. So as a new convert, 
those were my temptations. To go back to sin, to me, was going back to a, the party scene. Going back Friday night, Saturday night was the big temptation to hang out with friends and to get drunk. And uh, within those first few months of my Christianity, I had uh, a few relapses where I said, okay, I'll just hang out with my friends and say hi. Okay, I'll just have one beer to be social. Okay, I'll have two. Okay, I'll have three. And before you knew it, I was drunk. And I woke up condemned under the conviction of sin, knowing I was once again under the wrath of God, and I was quick to repent. Uh, because I knew the Bible said, drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if I, so I, if I backslide back to uh, drunkenness, uh, I'm condemned until I repent. So that's conditional salvation. Uh, the once saved, always saved crowd says, oh no, you can get drunk and you're still saved. Uh, I suppose maybe the perseverance crowd would say, oh, a true Christian would never do that. Uh, but Christians can sin. Uh, it's not impossible for us to, to get drunk or to get high or to fornicate or to do any sin. It's just that you're condemned until you repent. Uh, if you die in that sin, if you do not repent, then you go to hell. So when I was in my, my first church and I started looking at all these verses that you could lose your salvation, I shared it with some of the um, members of my church and one elder wanted to talk about it because his wife was upset and so he came over to my house and I asked him, well point blank, look at what if a Christian commits the things that are, you know, on this list. They fornicate or commit adultery or idolatry or drunkard or homosexual or whatever. I mean, according to this, those people don't go to heaven. So these are the sins that you forfeit your salvation over. And I asked him point blank, well, what if a Christian commits murder? Is he still saved? And he said, oh, yes, he's still saved. And he was kind of stunned that I asked him that. Uh, I found out later, uh, they, they, uh, he, they had an, he had his wife had an abortion because they were, they were older and ready to retire late in life and uh, had some money and wanted to enjoy their retirement years. Their children were all uh, raised. And then suddenly his wife gets pregnant with an unexpected baby. So... Uh, so he, he, knowing it was murder, knowing, because there are Christians and elders in the church, uh, knowing that it was wrong, they, uh, they murdered their baby. And, uh, he, but he said, nope, murderers, if you commit murder, you still, you're still once saved, always saved. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that no murderer has everlasting life. And uh, that's in 1 John. So, so we know that uh, those who commit murder, if, if a Christian commits murder, he's not saved anymore. I was asking that because I came out of the, the, uh, the life of crime. And uh, murder was on the list of possibilities when I was a criminal. And so I just wondered if I backslide into my sin and I become worse than I was before, uh, you know, I could, I could backslide and, and end up becoming a murderer. Am I still saved? Uh, thinking obviously not, uh, but he was surprised. He said, yeah, you're still saved. So obviously people deny biblical truth uh, for personal reasons. The Bible is very clear uh, that you, you can fall away from the faith. You can forfeit your salvation through sin. That sin can keep you out of heaven. The salvation is to be saved from sin not to be saved in sin. The Bible says he shall save his people from their sins. The Bible says he that sins is of the devil and whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And so uh, salvation isn't just being saved from hell, salvation is being saved from sin. So obviously a man who's living in sin is not saved if salvation is deliverance from sin. So in Acts 2.38, Peter told them to repent for the remission of sins. So you don't have forgiveness until you repent. There's this false notion in the church that once you become a Christian, all your sins, past, present, and future sins are forgiven. That's not true. Your past sins are forgiven because you've repented of them. You've turned away from them. But present sin would be willful sin. That's not forgiven. You're condemned for that if you have that. Uh, future sins you haven't even committed yet. You can't be forgiven of something you're not guilty of yet. And uh, forgiveness of present and future sins would be a license to sin. That's not how it works in the Bible. In the Bible, you have to repent, and after you repent, you're forgiven. You're not forgiven before you repent. So he told them, in Acts 2.38 to repent for the remission of sins. That means their penalty is remitted after they repent. And then if a believer sins, we see in Acts chapter 8, 
Well, in verse 13, there is a man named Simeon who it says Simeon believed the gospel. And Simeon, uh, or was it Simon? Simon the sorcerer. I think it's Simon. Simeon is the older man in the Bible waiting for the Messiah. Simon uh, was a sorcerer who heard the gospel, it says, and in verse uh, 8, 13, it says he believed and was baptized. So the apostles uh, believed him to be a believer. They baptized him. Uh, but then in verse 22, uh, Peter tells him to repent that his heart's not right because he wanted to buy the, the power of the Holy Ghost and to sell the power of the Holy Ghost. So Peter said, repent of this thy wickedness. So, hey, you have the antinomian crowd who says, oh, repent of your sin isn't found anywhere in the Bible. Well, here it is in Acts 8.22, repent of this thy wickedness. And uh, it says that the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. So here's a believer who was baptized, who then commits a sin, and Peter tells him to repent in order to be forgiven. So you don't have a blanket forgiveness of all your present and future sins. If sin occurs in your life, uh, you have to repent and be forgiven. There's a process of uh, repentance, confession. Uh, that's what we see also in uh, 1 John 1, 6 to 10. It says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So any sin that a believer commits, and he shouldn't be committing any, but if a believer sins, uh, then he needs to confess it to God and he needs to repent, and then he receives a fresh forgiveness. Uh, or I like how Finney called it a fresh justification. It's not a once, uh, once, once you're saved, you're always saved. Uh, Any time that you backslide into sin, you basically need to get resaved again through confession and through repentance and to be restored into fellowship. So here's the principle. You need to turn from sin to get saved and you need to stay away from sin to stay saved. And if you return to your sin, then you need to repent and return to the Lord to get saved again. You say, oh, saved again? Yeah, you know, the Bible says the prodigal son was, uh, was dead and now is alive again. And that word again means for the second time. A prodigal son is a backslider. And the prodigal son was, was alive then he was dead to the Father, and then he was alive again. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about that soon. But the Bible does say in Ephesians 5, 5 to 7, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, and, or the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So here again you see certain people will not go to heaven like whoremongers. Then it says the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. So if you're in disobedience, you're under his wrath. And then it says in verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. In other words, the world is in disobedience, the world is in sin, and the wrath of God is coming upon them because of it. Therefore, as Christians, we should not be partaking with the world, because then we are also ourselves going to be under the wrath. If we partake in their sins, then we will partake in God's wrath. So we have a reason not to partake with the world, because the wrath of God is coming upon them. We're supposed to be separate. Uh, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11.32, again, this is Paul's doctrine, he said, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. In other words, when a believer sins, the Holy Spirit comes and convicts him and chastens him, like I did as a new convert who uh, got saved out of drugs and alcohol, and then I relapsed back uh, a few months later uh, for one night into drunkenness, and the Holy Spirit came and chastened me, convicted me, told me I was condemned, urged me to repent. As least, he says, uh, he chastens us, least we be condemned with the world. In other words, if you don't listen to the chastening of the Holy Spirit, if you uh, shrug off the conviction and continue in that sin, you're going to be condemned with the world. But if you're quick to repent, uh, you'll be quick to be forgiven. If you will, uh, you know, 
zealously uh, turn back to the Lord, uh, he will eagerly uh, accept you back in. So all throughout the Bible you see conditional salvation. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So throughout the Christian life, people sin against you, and uh, you're supposed to forgive them uh, you know, if they repent, the Bible says, and uh, the same way it is with God. If you sin against God, he'll forgive you if you repent. So it's conditional. God will forgive you if you forgive others. If you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. It's not a one-time thing, a once-and-for-all thing. Uh, forgiveness is an ongoing thing. If you, uh, if you commit future sin and you repent, then you need to be forgiven. And then if you commit future sin again, you need to repent, and then you'll be forgiven. And if somebody sins against you, you need to forgive them. So God forgives you in exact proportion to you forgiving others. See, when you ask this question, you know, can you lose your salvation, you have to ask, well, what is salvation? What is it that's being lost? Well, in John 17:3 says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is knowing God. That's what it's all about, is a relationship with God. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life, the Bible says. Uh, living a life of sin, you're separated from God. You're abiding in death because you don't have a relationship with God. But when you repent of your sin and you're forgiven through Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with God, and that is true life. So it says here, life eternal is to know Him. But here's the thing. It says in Isaiah 59.2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So sin separates from God. You can't have everlasting life if you're in sin. The reason God instituted death in the beginning was because God didn't want sin to be eternal. So God doesn't give eternal life to sinners. God gives eternal death to sinners. Eternal life is for those who turn from their sin and enter into a relationship with God. You say, oh, but Isaiah, that's the Old Testament. Well, look at the New Testament. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 5, it says, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. So how do you know that you know him? If you keep his commandments. How do you know that you are in him? Uh, if the love of God is perfected in you. If you keep his word. And so the principle here is that uh, if you're living in sin, you can't know God. If you know God, you're not living in sin. So... If you backslide into sin, you don't know God anymore. You're once again separated from God. And that's what you saw with the prodigal son. Uh, the prodigal son, we read in Luke 15, 24, the father said about him, he said, For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So a prodigal son is a backslider who forsook his relationship with, with the father and because he wanted to live a life of sin he wanted his inheritance to go squander it on uh, prostitutes and other things so he forsook the father for a life of sin then he realized that sin uh, wasn't satisfying or fulfilling that it was stupid that what he was doing was idiotic so he returned to the Lord and uh, now he's alive again alive for the second time so you notice when he's in sin he's dead to the father he has no relationship but when he leaves the sin and returns to the Father, now he's alive. So that's how it works with uh, the Christian life. Uh, or that's how it works with everlasting life. That's just how it works with life. If you're living in sin, you're dead to God. And if you're alive to God, it's because you forsook your sin and turned your back on sin. But I've heard Calvinists say, but eternal life is eternal. It can't be lost. If you can lose it, it's not eternal. 
That's not how it works. You see, Adam had everlasting life, but it says in Romans 5.12 that by sinning, he lost it. The Bible says death came by sin. And I think in verse 12 there, that's primarily talking about uh, spiritual life uh, and spiritual death. Uh, that spiritual death to the Father uh, came by sin. That because of our sin, we're spiritually dead to God. And that's what he said, in the day that you sin, you will surely die. In the day that he sinned, he was separated from God. And uh, then the death of the body came after that. And so Adam had everlasting life, eternal life. There was no death physical or spiritual, until he sinned. So by sin, he forfeited everlasting life. So, yes, everlasting life can be lost, just like I lost my everlasting damnation. Hallelujah! I was on my way to hell. I was under the judgment of God. I was under the wrath of God. And uh, when I became a Christian, I changed my future and repented of my sin and uh, found a home in heaven. And the eternal damnation that I was under, uh, I lost it. So, uh, yes, you can lose uh, eternal salvation just like you can lose eternal damnation. Hallelujah! Alright, if you can lose your salvation, has anyone in the Bible ever lost it? Uh, one of my favorite theologians and revivalists is Charles Finney. Uh, Finney had a great theology on free will, a great theology on the atonement. Uh, he even taught conditional security. He said a believer is condemned whenever he sins and he must repent and receive a fresh justification. So he was great on that. Uh, but however, he did uh, teach this uh, perseverance of the saints to some degree. He said everyone who is truly saved will ultimately be saved. That even if they backslide into sin temporarily, God will chasten them, bring them to repentance, and uh, they, everyone who ever got saved will be saved in the end. I disagree with him on that, but Finney did say, if it could be shown from the Bible that anyone has ever lost their salvation and not gotten it back, basically, uh, then, um, then, then my doctrine would be, would be wrong, Finney said. If it could be shown that anyone ever lost their salvation and died in a state of condemnation, then my doctrine would be wrong. Now, there are examples of people in the Bible who lost their salvation. One of the first ones that ever stuck out to me was Matthew 18, verse 32 to 35, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Jesus told a whole parable about a man who lost his salvation. He said, uh, here's this man, he had this huge debt, and uh, he, the, he begged his master to forgive him. It was more than he could possibly pay, so his master forgave him of this enormous debt. But then uh, one of his fellow servants owed him money, a little bit of money, and he wouldn't forgive him, and uh, like, you know, threw him into prison, or you know, choked him. Uh, and when the master of the house found out, that he wouldn't forgive his fellow servant of a minor debt. He basically reinstated the debt that he had forgiven and, um, and sent him off to, to prison. And then Jesus said, So will my heavenly Father do to you if you don't from your heart forgive one another. And so Jesus taught conditional security that we're forgiven only so long as we forgive others, that if we don't forgive others, our own debt that God forgave will be reinstated and held against us. So the unforgiving servant lost his pardon. The once saved, always saved crowd can't say, well, he wasn't truly forgiven to begin with. He was forgiven. The master forgave him of an enormous debt. So he was saved uh, from the consequences of his debt. Um, but then he wouldn't forgive others, so he had his debt reinstated, and then he suffered the, the consequence of it and had to go to prison until it was all paid. So you can't say he was never truly forgiven to begin with. He was, uh, and, he lo and then he lost it. So the unforgiving servant. Uh, then you have the prodigal son. I've already mentioned him in Luke 15, 24. Uh, the prodigal son lost uh, his relationship with the father. He was alive, then he was dead, then he was alive again. So he got it back. Uh, uh, Simon, or Simeon, I don't know how, do you say Simon or Simeon? Is there a difference? I don't even know if there's a difference. Let's just call him Simon, because I've always heard of Simon the sorcerer. Anyway, Simon in Acts 
8.13, we already talked about he, got, he repented, uh, he believed, he was baptized in Acts 8.13, and then in Acts uh, 8.22 we had to uh, uh, repent for the remission of sins because, uh, uh, or repent for the thought of his heart to be forgiven him uh, because he had later sinned. And so he, he lost his right standing with God because of his sin. Then there's Judas. Now, some people try and say Judas was never a Christian to begin with. But the Bible says Jesus chose 12 men to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out devils. Uh, Jesus would not choose an unsaved man to preach the gospel. Uh, when he sent out his 12 disciples to preach the gospel, they had the public stamp of approval from Jesus. These were Jesus' preachers. Uh, Jesus was surprised when he said, uh, Have I not chosen you, and yet one of you is a devil? So Peter, or Judas backslid into a, a you know, sinful state and became a devil, but he wasn't that way when Jesus uh, chose him. In fact, in Matthew 19.28, Jesus told his twelve disciples that in heaven you have uh, twelve thrones in heaven by which you will judge the twelve tribes of Israel. So Judas had a throne in heaven, but yet later Jesus said it would have been better if Judas had never been born, because Judas obviously was going to go to hell and because of his sin. So Judas lost his throne in heaven. Uh, Judas lost his place in heaven. And that's what it says in Acts uh, 1.25, that by transgression, Judas fell from his apostleship. So he was a genuine apostle. He was a genuine disciple. And remember, to be a disciple, you have to forsake all to follow Christ. Uh, to be a disciple, you have to um, hate your mother and father and love him more than anything. And you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and come after him. For Judas to be a genuine disciple and apostle, he had to meet that criteria. And uh, he fell, according to Acts 1, he fell from his apostleship uh, by his transgression. I'd like to do a whole Bible study on Judas, um, actually. Jesus said he was a friend in whom he trusted. So why would Jesus trust him if he was never uh, genuine to begin with? If he was a devil the whole time, why would he say, my own familiar friend in whom I've trusted has lifted up his heel against me? So Judas was a friend. You can't have a betrayal without genuine friendship or loyalty. So at one point, at the beginning, Judas was saved, but he lost his salvation by sinning, and he died in his sin by suicide, and he went to hell. So here's examples. The unforgiving servant, the prodigal son, uh, Simon the sorcerer, and Judas, who all uh, lost their right standing with God. They lost their justification. They lost their salvation. Now, what about getting it back? If you lose your salvation, can you get it back? There's free will Baptists who say, once it's gone, it's gone forever. You can't get it back. And they base that on Hebrews chapter 6, where it says in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? Salvation. So they've tasted of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And uh, the Holy Spirit is given to believers, the, to those that obey Him. Actually, it says in Hebrews that the Spirit of God is given to those who obey Him. And they have tasted of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So here it's talking about someone who knew God, had salvation, fell away from the Lord, and now it's impossible to restore them. Uh, this, I believe, is talking about a, uh, a reprobate, someone who has sinned against so much knowledge of God that their restoration is impossible. I don't think it's talking about just a, a believer who commits a sin and then repents. It's talking about someone who has hardened their heart to the point of reprobation because there are verses that talk about being restored. For example, in James 
5, 19 to 20, it says, Brethren, if any of you do err, uh, and one uh, convert the sinner from the error of his way, let him know that he has saved a soul from death and has covered a multitude of sin. And so James 5, 19 to 20 is talking about restoring a fallen brother. And it, that word, uh, convert a sinner from the error of his way, that word convert means to reconvert, to return, to bring him back. Uh, we see the same thing in Luke 22, uh, 32, when Jesus said to Peter that Satan has desired to, uh, Satan has desired to shift you as wheat. Uh, Jesus said to Peter, says, but I have prayed for you, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And that word again for converted means to reconvert, uh, to be, he basically said when you are reconverted, it means to return or to revert. My phone keeps going off during this. That's funny. And I got all these tourists walking around. I tried to come here early. Uh, I, was, I was here at sunrise to try and beat all the traffic of people but they're they're coming so let me hurry up here almost done and then again we already saw in Luke 15 24 the prodigal son uh, the prodigal son was alive then dead then alive again so he lost it and then he got it back so if you're a backslider if you used to know the Lord used to walk with God and then you fell away into the world fell away from the faith and you're living in sin you can be restored if you repent you're a reprobate when your repentance is impossible when your heart is too hard. Um, but if you, if you are capable of repenting, uh, then you're capable of restoration. Well, what about in John 10, 27 to 28, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I'll give them everlasting life and they shall never perish. Yes, but that's conditional because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So as long as you're following him, he will give you everlasting life and you will never perish. But if you're like he talked about one of those lost sheep, one of those wandering sheep, uh, you need to be restored back. Uh, what about people say only false converts fall away? Uh, obviously that's like um, uh, a typical thing. If, if, if they fall away, they were never truly saved to begin with, they say. But in John 6.66, 6, uh, the Bible says many of Jesus' disciples followed him no more. It's funny because it's 666, John 666. Uh, the, the idea, and you hear it from you know, the Ray Comfort crowd, that a false gospel creates false converts and only false converts fall away. But Jesus had people fall away. And Jesus didn't preach a false gospel, uh, but yet even he had converts who fell away. But it doesn't say many of his false disciples followed him no more, or many of his disciples followed him no more because they were false. It simply says many of his disciples followed him no more. So, uh, so even Jesus, who had true disciples, uh, lost them. Oh, another quick thing about Judas. We, um, I want to do a Bible study on Judas, but remember Jesus said uh, to the Father, those that you've given me, I've lost none of them. Save the son of perdition. In other words, Jesus lost Judas. That's what that verse is saying. All right, summary, uh, a few more verses to come to the end here. Colossians 1, 22 to 23 says, if you continue. Notice the big word, if. If you continue. Uh, Mark 13.3 says, He that perseveres unto the end shall be saved. So there's this exhortation and warning, if you don't endure unto the end, you won't be saved. That doesn't say, like I heard, I think it was Piper or MacArthur, uh, both of whom are false teachers, by the way. They teach lots of false things, but they said uh, um, that verse, He that endures unto the end shall be saved. Oh, I, I understand that to mean the saved will endure unto the end. That's not what it says. It doesn't say the saved will endure unto the end. It says, He that endures unto the end shall be saved. Uh, Acts 13 to 43 it says the Apostle Paul uh, exhorted them to continue in the grace of God. Acts 14.22 says he exhorted them to continue in the faith. Jude 1.21 says to keep yourself in the love of God. John 15.9, Jesus said, keep yourself in my love. So here's all these exhortations. If you continue, persevere unto the end, uh, continue in grace, continue in faith, keep yourself in the love of God. These are all uh, exhortations and warnings that you can depart from the faith. There's another verse I didn't even list it here about uh, those who have shipwrecked their faith. 
uh, the Bible talks about those who have departed from the faith. Well, you can't depart from something you were never in. There's too many verses for me to go through in this video. It's already long enough. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to an article that I wrote. And that article uh, talks about all the different verses uh, that talk about how you can fall away uh, from the faith. Actually, see if I can look up. I wanted to look up a whole compilation of scripture that John Wesley put together. Wesley was better than, than Finney on this topic because even though Finney said if you sin you're condemned until you repent, uh, Wesley actually said that a true believer can fall away and perish and die in his sin. Let me look it up real quick so I can read it. It would be a great way to end this. Here he said, Calvinists who deny that salvation can ever be lost reason on the subject in a marvelous way. They tell us that no virgin's lamp can go out, no promising harvest can be choked with thorns, no branch in Christ can ever be cut off from, un, for, from unfruitfulness, no pardon can ever be forfeited, no name blotted out of the book. They insist that no salt can lose its savor, nobody can ever receive the grace of God in vain, or bury his talents, or neglect so great a salvation, or trifle away a day of grace, or look back, or put his hand to the gospel plow. Nobody can grieve the Spirit till he, till he is quenched, and strive no more, or deny the Lord who bought them, nor bring upon themselves swift destruction. Nobody or body of believers can ever get so lukewarm that Jesus will spew them out of his mouth. They reason, uh, they use these realms of paper to argue that if one ever got lost, he was never found. John 17, 12, that if one falls, he never stood. Romans 11, 16 to 22, and Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, that if one was cast forth, he was never in. And if one ever withered, he was never green. John 15, 1 to 6, and that if any man draws back, it proves he had never been drawn, uh, it proves he had never had anything to draw back from. Hebrews 10, 20, or 10, 38 to 29, that if one ever falls away into spiritual darkness, he was never enlightened. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, that if you are again entangled in the pollutions of the world, it shows you, were nev you never escaped. Or 2 Peter 2, 20, and that if you put away salvation, you never had, had it put away. Uh, if you make shipwreck of faith, there was no ship of faith there. In short, they say, if you get it, you can't lose it, and if you lose it, you never had it. May God save us from accepting a doctrine that must be defended by such fallacious reasoning. I told a joke uh, a little while ago. So my wife came into the room and said, uh, uh, you know, where, uh, honey, I lost the car keys. And I said, well, if you lost them, then you never had it. And she said, well, that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> exactly. If you lose it, you never had it makes no sense at all. So click the link to my article. You can read more about this topic. It's really important. And uh, leave a comment uh, if you liked this video. Encourage me to make more Bible study videos. I want to do one on uh, Judas, one on repentance, one on holiness. Uh, leave a comment. Tell me what you want to see a Bible study video on. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not already so that you get future Bible studies. I want to do a whole Bible study series. So, anyways, thanks for watching and God bless you. All right, everybody, I'm going to give you the last grand tour here. This, I think, is the actual penitentiary that they used. At least, uh, this is the picture that I first saw of this place with these oak trees. And uh, I'll give you a little tour. Pretty cool. See these huge walls. Why? Maybe even if it wasn't used as a penitentiary, it sure could be. These beautiful oak trees. There is a little path right through here. And then boom. Just some more. 
crevices. So I think that'll wrap up our video. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you want the next Bible study video to be about. God bless you guys. Read your Bible every day. Read it, believe it, and obey. It'll change your life.